This morning we're talking about Jesus' famous words in Mark chapter 8. But before we do, uh, I want to tell you a story about my godson, Cohen. Will you put Cohen's picture up on the screen? This is Cohen. Isn't he so precious? I think Riley actually took this photo. Riley, great work. Great work. But this is Cohen. He is, I think he's four now, which is crazy. And um, he is a very ornery kid. He is very ornery. He does not like to do what you tell him to do, but he's so precious and he's so hilarious and he's so smart. He is just so smart. So I was with him a few weeks ago and he's really into dinosaurs. Anyone else, your kids were or are really into dinosaurs? Yes, yeah, he's super into dinosaurs. He's telling me all about, you know, the T-Rex and Velociraptor and, and all this stuff. And Cohen he likes to kind of try to trick you sometimes. So I'm interacting with him, and we're playing that, you know, we're in Jurassic Park and all this stuff, and, and I've seen all the Jurassic Park movies, I've seen The Land Before Time. Like, I feel like I have a pretty decent knowledge about dinosaurs. I'm not, I'm not a genius, but I, I, like, know what a lot of them are. And so he's naming off all these dinosaurs, and he says, Diplodocus. And I said, that is not a real dinosaur. I've never heard of that in my life. Do any of you know if that's a real dinosaur or not? Anybody know? Well, so I'm going back and forth with him, and I'm like, that is not real. That is not real. Stop saying that. It's not real. It's not real. I've never heard of it, so it can't be real. Well, I get home, and I'm sharing this story. I forget where I was. I think I was with our family, maybe. I, I don't know. But I'm like, he kept trying to trick me, and someone goes, well, did you look it up? And I said, no. It, it has to be fake. It sounds totally fake. And so someone looked it up. This is a Diplodocus. It looks very similar to a brontosaurus, but it is different. It is very real, though. It, it did exist. The diplodocus is real. And so the next time I see Cohen, I owe him a very big apology because I was, like, adamantly arguing with him. I was like, stop lying to me. This is not real. And here's, here's the thing I've had to accept, and this is kind of leading into our message for this morning. I am capable of error. <laughs> You guys are all like, yes, you are. We know you. Yeah, but I am capable of error. I am capable of thinking that I know something and then just really not. I wasn't going to share this story because I feel like it's actually very embarrassing, but for the first couple of years Josh and I were married, I kept getting our anniversary wrong. I just really, I, when we were planning it, we were looking at couple dates at the end of July, and I just, in my mind, was like, we got married on the 29th. And Josh was like, no, we didn't. And normally it's the other way around, right? The stereotype is that the guy gets the anniversary wrong. But it was me. It was me. I'm terrible with dates. I'm terrible with names. If I meet you and I'm like saying your name a lot to you, it's because I'm terrible. And so I just have to work really hard to remember information. And I am capable of being wrong. I ran into uh, somebody a few weeks ago at our district council, and I really thought his name was Tyler, and his name was Taylor, and I was just calling him Tyler, and it was, it was very embarrassing, and I had to apologize to him, and I said, I am capable of error. I'm capable of error. I'm capable of thinking that I know something, and just absolutely not. And as humans, we are going to get a lot of things right, hopefully. Hopefully, we're going to get a lot of things right, but we also have to have a humility and an understanding to be able to say to our four-year-old godsons, I am so sorry, you knew more than me. I am capable of error. And this is our first key point for this morning. I am capable of error. I'm just going to keep saying it because it's good for me. I am capable of error. And when we look at the end of Mark chapter 8 and some of Jesus' most famous words, before we get there, I think we have to know, why does Jesus end up saying this? Do you ever wonder that sometimes you hear like some of these like famous lines in Scripture and you're like, what? what led to this? What led to you saying this to the disciples in this moment? And in Mark chapter 8, Jesus has been healing people. He's been feeding people. He's been doing all these crazy miracles. And the disciples are all a part of this. They are all traveling with him. They are walking together. They're talking together. They're eating together. They're doing life together. They are very much a part of what Jesus is doing. They're not only seeing all the things he's doing, but they're like experiencing them and, and they're hearing and all these different things. And they still don't really seem to get, though, who he is or what he's doing. And we know that because 
In verse 28, Jesus asks them this question as they're walking along the road. He says, who do people say that I am? Who do people? We're interacting with, I mean, hundreds of people sometimes in in an instance. Hundreds of people would come and listen to him teach and preach and, and all these things. And he goes, who are you hearing people like say that I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, who was a prophet. Some others say that you're one of the other prophets. But then he asks them this. He says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, good old Peter, we give Peter such a, Peter's just the most real disciple because he gets a lot of stuff really right and a lot of stuff really wrong. And in this moment, he gets it really right. And the scriptures tell us that through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is given the insight to be able to say, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the one we've been waiting for. You are the one sent to save us. And Jesus is like, you did it. You know, gold star for you, Peter. Like, good job. And he's like, this is not something you could have understand on your own, but God gave you the insight to be able to understand it. And then Jesus warns them not to tell anybody yet who he is. Don't tell anyone yet. He begins to explain to them in detail what was going to happen. He tells them. He doesn't hide anything from them. He's like, look, I've, I've come to die. I'm going to suffer. All of these religious elders and teachers of the law are not going to like me. They are going to come against us. They are going to be the ones who want to have me put to death. I will die. But three days later, I'm going to come back, so it's fine. And specifically in verse 32, it tells us that Jesus talked openly with them. He talked openly. To me, that means there was this ability, you know, they're, they're asking questions, they're dialoguing, they're having this just open conversation about what his mission was. What was his purpose? And as he's doing this, and maybe you've experienced this moment, you know, on all the years I was a youth pastor, I had a lot of moments like this. You're having like really deep conversation, and then there's like one kid, and they come over to you and they're like, actually that's not correct, you know what I mean, or something like that. And this is what Peter does. Peter comes over to Jesus, and he pulls him aside, and he says, you should not be saying these things. You should not be telling us that you've come to die. That's not true. That's not right. Dippledocles isn't real, you know? And he's rebuking and correcting Jesus, who he's just acknowledged is the Messiah. Like, can you just laugh at this moment Peter's the one who says, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, you are the Son of God. And then he's like, "Uh uh-uh, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. Be quiet. Stop saying that. And Jesus, he looks at Peter, and he says his famous words to Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. Oh, how would you like that? You are seeing things merely through a human point of view and not from God's. So Peter's gone from just being a genius to being Satan. What a switch. What a switch. But just like Pastor Josh talked about last week, it's so dangerous when we are looking at things through our own human foolish perspective. When we look at things through that lens, we are a lot of times going to end up not being in line with what God is doing. But again, remember that we are capable of error. We are capable of error. And so Jesus like corrects Peter in this moment, but he doesn't like kick Peter off the team. He doesn't demote him. He he just, he corrects him and they move on. And they just move on. And we have to understand that when we look at things through our own way, through the way that we want things to happen, we will never be able to see what God is doing or who he really is. And this is our next key point for this morning if you're taking notes. Jesus didn't come to have it good. He came to make things good. He didn't come as this king who was going to live in a palace and come and conquer Rome and live in luxury, all the things that the people thought he was going to do. He came to make things good in the best way possible. He did not come to be able to live life temporarily in comfort. He came to live in discomfort so that we would be able to experience eternal comfort, so that we would be able to benefit from what he was doing. And in order to make things right, he was going to have to suffer. And he spoke openly about it with the disciples, because this was going to become their assignment too. It was going to become their assignment too, to suffer, to not always have it easy. 
You see, following Jesus is really costly. It's costly. It's costly. And if it feels easy to you all the time, you may not be really following the true version of Jesus. That's not to say your life should feel hard and terrible and, you know, all these different things, but it will cost you. It will cost you to follow him. And Peter, he wanted a version of Jesus where Jesus wasn't going to have to suffer and because he loved him. Peter wasn't trying to be selfish. Peter loved Jesus. He didn't want Jesus to have to die and go through all those different things. But what Peter didn't understand is that if he really did love Jesus, he would get in line with what God was doing. And because he was choosing to be out of alignment with God's plan, Jesus had to kind of get on him a little bit. And how many of us have been this person? I know I have. I I know there's a lot of days where I'm this person. I'm like, God, this is just like too hard. This is too hard. I don't want to do this. I don't want to suffer. I, I just want to be able to have things be easy. But Jesus didn't come to make things be easy. He came to make things be good. He came to make things be good. And any time that I find myself where I'm just really struggling, I find myself out of alignment. And about a year ago, I hurt my back really badly. You know, I, as a young 20-year-old a long time ago, I remember hearing people talk about back problems, and I thought, you're such a wuss. Like, get over it. Your back hurts. And then I really hurt my back last year, and it's the most terrible pain I've ever experienced. I am capable of error. And and it was just awful. It was awful. Um, It was during during fireworks, and we had just torrential rain, and and I'd gone up onto one of the semi-trailers one day, and a ton of water was leaking in onto our fireworks, and there was nobody else out there that afternoon. And so I moved every box in the trailer by myself. And because I was like panic moving the boxes, I wasn't moving them like how you're supposed to, like lift with your legs, all that kind of stuff. So I, I had a pinched nerve in my back, but I ignored it. I ignored it, and I ignored it, and I ignored it for months until finally it was so bad that I was losing feeling in my legs and I wound up in the ER because I didn't know like what was going on. An ER visit later, and then multiple months of being at a chiropractor later, I was still out of alignment. I was still out of alignment because I'd hurt myself so badly. And I'll never forget the first time I went to the chiropractor, and it was just, it was excruciating pain. I couldn't sleep at night. I mean, I would just be crying in pain, and it really takes a lot for me to get to that place. And he looked at me, and he said, oh, yeah, I can see easily what the problem is. He looked at me for about five seconds, and he said, your legs are about an inch different right now and they're not supposed to be like that. And he said, and your pelvis is twisted an inch out of alignment as well. So you're walking crooked and lopsided. And so naturally, I was in a lot of pain, but he could see it instantly. And I would go to the chiropractor multiple times a week, and sometimes nothing would move, like literally nothing would move, because that's how locked up my body was. And finally, after months, I was able to find some relief, and then now I'm, I'm seeing somebody else, and they're trying something different with me, and, and it seems like it's working. But here's the thing. God looks at us when we're in pain, and he says, look, I can see instantly what the problem is. I can see instantly what it is. And if you're willing to come and spend time with me, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to fix you. And it might be a little painful to get things back in alignment, It will be costly for you to come into alignment with what I'm asking you to do, but it will be worth it. It will be worth it. To get our hearts, our minds, our lives in line with Christ, a lot of times is going to be really painful because we're fighting against our, like, selfish human nature. We're fighting against our need to be in control. And every time that God asks me to do something that stretches me beyond what I'm comfortable with, It doesn't always feel fun in the moment. It doesn't. But when I surrender to him and I obey, the outcome later, it's always worth it, right? Like I'm always glad later because I begin to see things through his eyes and not through mine. And this is how God wants us to live. And when we choose to live in alignment with him, it's such a better way to live. It's such a better way to live. And this is the next key point this morning. There is no better way to live than with and for Jesus. To live with and for him. 
And sometimes I think we do one or the other. We don't always, maybe aren't always great about doing them both at the same time. We can live with Jesus and we come to church and we read our Bible and we pray. We can live for Jesus and we're like kind to people and we're generous and we like volunteer and we do all these different things. But to do things with and for Jesus at the same time is so powerful. That's true alignment with who he is. When we have that right relationship with him, that love for him, and then out of that, we are doing the things that he is asking us to do. It's beautiful. And Jesus is trying to show his followers, which includes us today. We are an extension of the disciples, right? He's trying to show them the way to really live, the better way to live. And this is what brings us to his famous words in verses 34 through 38. Then he called the crowd to join his disciples, and he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in all his glory of the Father and the holy angels. Understand what Jesus is asking us here. He's asking us to live like him, to take up our cross. And I know to us today in, in the modern world, like the cross is like a very positive image. It's like a hopeful image. You know, I've got it like tattooed on my wrist. You might wear it on a necklace. It's, it's a message of hope for us. To the disciples in this moment, the cross was an instrument of torture and death. The cross was not a positive symbol. The cross would have been like, you know, something just terrible. And Jesus is saying, die to yourself. Die to yourself. Die to your desires. Die to your selfishness. Die to your pride. Die to your need to have everything be perfect and everything be easy. Leave it here and pick up what I have for you. Because there's nothing more important than your soul. And it's this paradox of losing what we want to hold on to the most in order to pick up what God has for us. And so this is where the treasure chests come into play this morning. I stole both of these from the kids' classrooms. So if your child is upset this morning that their treasure chest was missing, you can tell them who stole it. Uh, and so, you know, this is kind of like our life. We have this cute little treasure chest, and it's like ornate, and it has, you know, maybe stuff inside, and, and this is our life. And a lot of times, this is like what we know. This is what we're comfortable with. This is what we can have control over. We can carry it around easily. And in order to be who God is asking us to be, he asks us to set it down. He asks us to set down the thing that we might treasure the most in order to pick up something that we might not know what it's going to look like. We might not know how it's going to turn out. We, can, we know God says it's going to be good. But I think a lot of times we like try to hold on to our stuff and we try to also pick up what Jesus has for us and we just like can't. I'm going to re-injure my back. We just like can't. We can't. You can't pick up both. You just can't. You can't live with one foot in one door and another foot in another. I mean, God is really specific about this. He says you can't, you have to choose. Are you going to be hot or are you going to be cold? Are you going to live for me or are you going to not? There's no middle ground. There's a lot of things in the world where there's like a middle ground. This is not something where there's a middle ground. We have to be willing to set it down so that we can pick it up. So that we can pick up the thing that's like so much better, it's so much bigger, might not look as fancy on the outside, but Melissa has a lot of treasures on the inside of this. There's a lot of treasures. And this is what it's like. In order to pick up what God has for you, you must lose and choose to lay down the thing that you have. And that's your life. It's your life. In order to fully receive all the good God has for us, we must let go of what we have and what we think we know. That's the final key point for this morning. There's a lot of stuff we think we know. We think we know. We think we know. Diplodocus, July 29th, Tyler, you know. I mean, we think we know all these things, right? We think we know. And God says, but man, a lot of times you just don't. 
You just don't. And so will you trust me? Will you lay it down so you can pick it up? Will you lay it down? Let go of what you have and what you think you know. We have to make a choice, though. We have to make a choice. And it's a choice we get every single day. We get this choice every day. Sometimes you might get this choice multiple times a day. You get the ability to be able to choose. Am I going to choose my own way? Or am I going to choose to live fully for God with everything that I'm doing? And so as the band comes this morning, I have some questions for you. I have some questions. If you're taking notes in the app, you'll see that there's like a final question in there. And maybe you can take some time and you can answer that. But this morning, how is your soul? How is your soul doing? Do you feel just worn out? Do you feel constantly like you're just in pain? You're just fighting against something. Maybe this morning you're going to come to the recognition that you're fighting against God's will and you need to just surrender. Surrender to him. What are the things that you know God is asking you to do but you keep not doing them? You keep not doing them because you're too busy holding on to your little box. What are the things that you need to be obedient about? You need to be obedient to just do them, even if they're hard. What do you need to lay down so that you can pick up true life? So that you can pick up what's better? What do you need to lose? Maybe there's something instantly that comes to your mind. It's just like dead weight in your life. You need to lose it. You need to lose it. And the question this morning is like, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? Risk it to follow Jesus and see what happens because I can guarantee you that though it might not always be easy, it will always be better. What do you have to lose this morning? You have everything to gain from following Jesus, but it really is all about your perspective. It's all about your perspective. This is the way. Surrender is the way. Surrender. But in order to surrender, we've got to drop some stuff. We've got to drop it. And I'll just speak from my own perspective, but there's so many days I feel like I'm struggling. I'm struggling because I'm struggling to be in control. I'm struggling because I'm holding on to my box and I'm trying to drag this box behind me. And this morning, I want to lay down my life so I can pick this up fully. This is the way. Jesus is the way. If you want to live a life that matters, a life of significance, a life of purpose, a life of just joy, this is the way. And it starts when we're just willing to admit, God, I might not know everything. I might not have been doing everything right. Help me. Help me to follow you. Help me to follow you closer. And in these moments, we have the ability to just be open and to hear from the Lord. To hear his wisdom and his loving conviction that comes alongside us. And it says, look, I know you've been missing it a little bit. But just get back in alignment with me. Let's go. Let's run. Let's go. And I think that's what God would say to a lot of us this morning. He's not here to like beat you up because you haven't been making the perfect decisions. He's like, this is the perfect morning for you to choose to come in alignment with me and let's go. I have a mission for you. I have a purpose for you. It doesn't matter who you are in this room. You could be a middle school student. You could be a grandma or grandpa in this room. And God says, I have a mission for you. I have a mission for you in this world. And it's too important for you to waste any more time holding onto this small, insignificant box. Pick up what's significant. Pick up what I have for you. Jesus, he is beckoning you this morning to come and follow him. But he doesn't do it lightly. He doesn't hide anything from you. He wants you to understand the cost. But he also wants you to understand the joy and the purpose that await you. There is nothing like living for Jesus. There is nothing. It will not be easy, but this is the way. So God, this morning, We look to you. God, we know you have been chasing after us. 
that you have never given up on us. You have never lost sight of us for one second. You know exactly where each of us are this morning. God, you see us. We might not feel like other people always see the things that are going on or the things that we're feeling, but God, you do. And you love us so completely. You love us fully. There's so much grace and mercy available to us. And this morning, you are begging for us to turn to you fully. To stop living with one foot in one door and another foot in the other. That we would surrender completely to your will and your way. We don't want to live out of alignment. We don't want to continue to live confused, in chaos, and in pain. God, that is not how you designed for us to live. You designed us to live free, to live with joy, to live in your strength that enables us and equips us to do more than we could ever have thought. God, I pray this morning for anyone who just feels this morning like they are at their breaking point, like it is too heavy. God, would you come alongside and encourage them? Would you equip them to keep doing the work that you have asked them to do? May we not grow weary in doing the things that you have asked us to do. For we know that in due time, you will will reap a harvest of righteousness if we do not give up. God, would you instill perseverance within us? Would we not only have the sight to see what you're doing, but would we have the endurance to keep running after you, to keep running with you and for you? Because we know we're not doing it on our own. We're doing it through your strength and through your help. God, this morning, we just want to surrender. We want to surrender to your will and your way because there is no other way to live. There really is no option. We can choose a lot of other things, but God, they're not really options that are ever going to lead us toward you, that are ever going to lead us toward anything good. God, lead us in goodness this morning turn our hearts to you. May we repent this morning that we would have a change of mind and heart and direction. God, this morning, may I be the first to repent. God, would you change my heart? Would you change my mind? Would my mind be like yours? If I'm not going in the right direction, would you change the path and may I have the courage to follow after you? We thank you that you are a God who leads us. You don't just like abandon us and say, go figure it out. You are leading us and walking with us because that's who you are. You are good. You are good and you have good for us. May we claim it and cling to it this morning because of everything that you have done for us. We have that ability. God, we love you. We want to follow you. There is no other way. This is the way. Forgive us when we keep trying to force our own way and our own agenda. God, forgive us. We want to do what's true and what's right. And may it start this morning with just simply turning our hearts to you and may every one of us in our hearts be willing to say, God, forgive me. I am capable of error. Show me where to go. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.